So we're going to move into the question and answer time. But before we do, I'd just like to pass the microphone over to our other panel member uh, to introduce herself. Thank you. My name's Heather Steele, and I'm representing the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. There's three branches to our service. Firstly, the Earthquake Support Coordination Service, and my role is as a coordinator. And it's a free service available to you to assist you through your journey. So the first step is really establishing a plan, uh, working out what your objective is, what you want to achieve, uh, working alongside you, supporting you, and connecting you to the right people that will hopefully be able to get you the information, explain everything to you, and reach an informed decision. Um, we're often asked to support you attending meetings, particularly those when you're perhaps having uh, engineers, you might have Fletcher coming to your site to do a scope, you might be wanting to attend the residential advice service, go to a meeting with your insurance, etc. And we can be another set of ears for you at those meetings, perhaps recording notes, etc., where you can't always focus on everything at the same time. The second service that we have, or second stream, is the matching and placing service from the accommodation team. So when you get to the stage where you do need to move out of your accommodation uh, while your house is rebuilt or repaired, then we can assist you find alternate accommodation, whether it be private or the government-supported accommodation in the villages. We can link you into uh, the accommodation at Linwood, Rawiti, Rangers Park or Kaiapoi, or with private landlords that we have listed with. The third stream of assistance that we have is the temporary accommodation assistance, which is the financial package that's available to you if you exhaust all your insurance uh, funds that are available for your temporary accommodation. So the government provides a package that at the moment is in effect to the end of 2017. Uh, it's non-income non tested and it is basically set depending on your family circumstances. We do have a coordinator at the hub on Monday to Thursday when it's open, so if you feel you want to come and talk with a coordinator initially, uh, you're welcome to do so. We have brochures available tonight just down on the back table and you can take those away uh, with you, which have the 0800 contact numbers, um, but feel free to use, utilise the service if you wish. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks for that, Heather. So obviously there are um, services available to help you through this process and if you are feeling a bit overwhelmed or just feeling that this is quite a lot of information and you need to be walked through it a little bit, then by all means we really encourage you to take advantage of that. So Bob's got the microphone. Uh, just go ahead and signal to him if you do have a question and he'll pass the microphone to you. Um. Yeah, so we were a complex repair at the start of the year. Uh, we've been designated as uneconomic to repair. My question relates to contingency and what's a reasonable expe expectation in a cash settlement offer under those circumstances. So it is um, variable depending on the site and we can't really put a percentage on it. John might speak to the Avonside Holdings case which has been um, released recently, but it would depend. So in some cases, if the risk is all in the foundations, then you might apply a percentage to the foundations and not to the above ground. Um, if it was just in general that your worried cost might escalate, you might want a contingency across everything, but it is site specific. Um, Contingencies are about unknown costs, so that's where the more certainty you can get, the less you need to rely on contingency, but it, yeah, it is very individual um, to the site. Um, I just, here's the case here, Avonside. So um, the issue in this case was that, was whether or not contingency costs had to be included when a property was settled on the basis of a notional rebuild. It was settled on that basis because it was in the red zone. Southern Response said that contingency costs did not have to be included, but the property owner said that they did have to be included. The Supreme Court 
held unanimously that they did have to be included. And um, I'll just read what they said. Um, so this is paragraph um, 38. They said, the exercise that is required is to estimate the actual cost of rebuilding the house on the site, so the fact that it was notional was irrelevant. And then they said, Mr Harrison, who is the quantity surveyor, in accordance with what is agreed to be standard quantity surveying practice, included a sum of 10% for contingencies. That does not mean that 10% will be right for every site, but it's not a legal issue, so the lawyers just have to step back a little bit. It's a quantity surveying issue, and quantity surveyors can certainly figure that out. And um, I thought, well, what's my response as a lawyer to how much contingencies should be paid? And the answer is, I don't know, I'm a lawyer, but we have a technical panel at RAS, and so our quantity surveyor gave a little bit of information about contingency fees, so I just read out what he said. He defined it as an amount required to cover uncertainty, and what is uncertain in an estimate for reinstatement or a rebuild could include ground conditions, structure inside walls where no invasive investigation has been carried out, um, areas under a floor that have not been uncovered or x-rayed, so no critter camera has gone under, the subfloor of a concrete floor that is to be epoxy filled, interpretation of inadequately completed design documents, and interpretation of building regulations or codes. And he said, to counter the effect of these uncertainties, contingency is generally applied to estimates of cost to provide for their potential cost to a project. The contingency is generally regarded as a provisional allowance to be expended if the need arises. While there are no firm rules within the construction industry for contingency allowances, there is an understanding that there should be contingency allowed during the estimate stage for as yet undesigned work and a contingency allowance for use once the construction phase is up and running. So there's design contingency and construction contingency. Um, I hope that's helpful. Just from an insurance point of view, that is why it's so individual, because it depends on at what stage you are that you start your negotiation. So what John just touched on was contingencies during design and construction, but if you're already through the design phase, for example, then there wouldn't be contingencies because it's not unknown. So that's why you just need to have the conversation. Is it a fact that with multi-dwellings that if one person decides they can't cooperate with the insurer that all of the dwellings in the multi-dwelling property have to be cash settled? Uh, it depends again on the site but the best outcome is if you can get everyone to agree because if there's different insurers, um, we can't get involved in um, disputes between neighbours. So we would try to mediate. Um, RAS also have a service where they will try to mediate and would try to get the best outcome for everyone. But if we are stuck in a position where there's one person who doesn't want to reinstate and properties are joined, then often we are left with no option but to cash settle. Um, if the properties are shared, but they don't have shared elements, then maybe, maybe you can have a mixed model of settlement. It does really depend on the property. But if you've got a specific example, you can talk to me afterwards and I can see what we can do. Um, another thing that's going on at the moment is the district plan changes, some of which are quite major and may affect consenting and things like that. And I just wondered where you get advice about how to allow for that and, yeah. Um, the best place to go for those sorts of issues is the council. So it's possible for anyone to have a free 30-minute consultation with the Christchurch City Council Consent Department. The council also has a presence here at the hub, so it would be possible to have that conversation here. And that is a starting point. But having said that, it can raise an issue as to whether who should bear the cost of compliance, whether it should be the insurer or the homeowner. 
and sometimes there's agreement on that issue and sometimes it's disputed and that's something that just has to be worked through. The good news is it's easier with a rebuild than a repair in terms of flood levels and those types of things, if it's about flood levels, yeah.